I hope everybody is well, well fed, well rested and well ready for this afternoon's presentation. It is, as always at this time, it's Bible Hour, so I want to welcome those of you who are here in church and those of you who are online as well. Welcome to West Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church Bible Hour. Now, we have a very specific topic for this evening. Um, hopefully you can see something on the screen that's telling you what the topic is for today. I'm just trying to get my equipment in gear. Here we go. The topic for today is all about jewelry and adornment. Now, jewelry and adornment within Christianity, within Adventism, this can be a bit of a hot topic. Traditionally, Seventh-day Adventists were known as a people who didn't wear jewelry, didn't adorn themselves, were plain, if I can put it that way, natural. But there have been some changes that have been creeping into the church. So we're going to examine, we're going to see what's the biblical basis, who got it right, who got it wrong. Before we go any further, let's have a word of prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, dear Lord, as we've come before you this afternoon to open up your word, to study on this particular subject, I pray, Lord, that you will bless us and be with us now. I ask that you will give me a portion of your Holy Spirit. Give me wisdom as I speak. And I pray that you will be with everybody who's joining us, whether online or in the church. May we gain a blessing from this afternoon's presentation. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's open it up. And uh, let's, let's start to ask a few questions. For those of you who are at home online, there is a watcher in the house today at the moment. And we will be watching online so any questions, any comments that you want to make, put them in the chat if you're on YouTube or if you're on the live West Croydon SDA Church webpage, you can do either. But please, if you've got any questions or any comments, feel free to put them on there and hopefully the watcher will get through to me and let me know what the comments are. So, jewellery and adornment. First question. I have got a list of three, four, five, six 
uses of jewelry and adornment in the Bible. Can anybody give me just one, one of the six that I've got here, what were the uses that jewelry and adornment were put to in Old Testament times? Now, we should have a roving mic. I can see we've already got one answer coming up. So, roving mic be on the ball, please. It was used for a wealth. Okay, thank you. Very good. Yes, it was used for wealth or evidence of wealth. Any other answers? Any other uses of jewelry and adornment? Use the mic, please. Was it used to build the sanctuary? There was gold present in the sanctuary. You're absolutely right. There was gold present in the sanctuary. Um, yeah, okay. I, I will accept that. That probably will go to be number seven because I'm looking for the use of jewelry and adornment, so personal use. So we've got evidence of wealth. We've got another hand that's gone up there at the back. Where's our roving mic? If I'm not right, uh, they, they use a ring for a signature or a signet. Okay, so a signet ring. So you're talking about a, a symbol of something. Okay. Any other uses? Yes, we've got another hand that's going up. You see, as people start to think, they're starting to realize how jewelry was used. As part of um, betrothal. Part of betrothal. Give Wedding. Given by, given by what, the, the husband's family, a like diary. That's Thank you. That, that's that's, that's the, the, the perfect word. word, yes. So the dowry. Okay, so we've got sim a symbol of authority. We've got evidence of wealth. We've also got it used in, as the dowry in, the, um, in marriage ceremonies. What about personal adornment? Is jewellery used in Old Testament times? Did the children of Israel use jewellery for personal adornment? Now again, if you're going to say anything, you've got to speak to the mic because those at home just won't hear you. So can we have the roving mic, please? Earrings and necklaces and anklets and nose rings. And okay. Can somebody find for me Ezekiel chapter 16? And in Ezekiel 16, I'd like us to look at verses 11 to 15. In fact, actually, we can go from 10. Let's go from 10 to 15. Ezekiel 16, 10 to 15. Yeah, I'm asking someone to read, and again, I want to see where the microphone is. Our roving mic is, unfortunately, not paying attention. There we go. I, I clothe thee also with, with broidered work, and shod thee with badgers, with badger skin. And I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I, de I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets of on thy, hand, thy hands and a chain on thy neck and I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thine ears and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus, thus was, was sorry, thou didst decked with gold and silver and, and, they, and thy raiment was of thy fine linen and silk and broidered work thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil and thou wast exceedingly 
be exceedingly beautiful and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for, for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty and pledged the harlot because of thy renown. And, sorry, I can't see it now. And put a proud, poured death, poured us out thy fornications on everyone that passed by. Sorry, his it was. Okay, thank you so much. Hopefully you heard that at home, but it was... Um, we were looking there at, as I say, Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 11 to 15. This is an allegorical passage that's used here. God is talking about the children of Israel, about his bride. But notice he talks about the different adornments and jewelries that refer to a bride. So, for example, if you look at Genesis chapter 24 and verse 22, if someone could find that for me, please. Genesis 24, verse 22. Anyone got it? And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekel weight of gold. Thank you. Now, what's this story that's being related here? We've done this recently in Sabbath school lesson. Again, microphone please. Servant went to find a wife for um, Jacob. No, for, for, Is for Isaac. For Isaac. Yes. So Abraham sent out Abraham sent out his servant to go and find a wife for his son Isaac. And notice what happened. Jewelry was used. It was part of the bride price. So we can see that certainly there is a usage of jewelry in that way. And in fact, there's several verses that we can go to throughout the Bible. Notice also Exodus 28 and verse 2. What does Exodus 28 and verse 2 say? And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments of consecrate, to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now, if you read on, and we're not going to read the whole chapter now, but if you read the whole chapter, you will see that the garments that were used, the dress of the high priest was certainly adorned with various jewels and ornaments. Now, there's another sense in which jewellery was used in the Old Testament times. And this we've seen actually in Genesis 24 and verse 22. When, the, when Abraham's servant gave this adornment, I think actually, could you just read that verse again? Genesis 24, 22. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hand of ten shekels weight of gold. Now, did you notice that there was a mention of the weight of gold there? And there's a reason why it's, meant it. it's mentioned that way, because it was a common practice in the Middle East, and particularly in those times, to make jewellery to a standard weight so that it could be used in commercial transactions. Now, we actually see this still in existence today. In this country, it doesn't really work. If you buy a gold chain in the, in the jewellery shop, you're going to pay, let's say, for example, you pay £100 for the gold chain. And then at a certain point, you say, look, I need some money, I'm going to go and sell my gold chain. 
when you go to sell it for scrap, what happens? First of all, they assay it. They want to know what carrot it is. And quite often it can be 18 carat. Now, 18 carat is not pure gold. 24 carat is pure gold. So what they will do is they will weigh it, and they will say, right, it weighs this amount. The value of gold is this amount. So we multiply the two together, but because you've only got 18 carat and not 24, we take off 25% of the price. We take off a little bit more for having to smelt it down. Doesn't matter how beautiful the work is, you don't get any money for the work. You just get paid for the price of gold. Now, if you go out into the Far East, countries like uh, China, uh, Thailand, or around the Southeast Asian Peninsula, the gold that they sell there is fine, pure gold. And when they sell it, they sell it by weight. So somebody will go and they will say, I want to buy this chain. And they will weigh the chain and say, right, the price of gold is this. That's how much you pay for the chain. Then later on, when they get to hard times and they need to buy something, or perhaps let's say, for example, the freezer packs up. And they say, right, I need to go and buy a new freezer. They will take off the gold chains, go back to the shop. It's weighed. The price of gold is this at the moment. And that's the money you get for the chain. So... A lot of time, the jewelry that was worn was used as currency. And in fact, still in, in places in the Middle East, it's more decorative than actual, but brides will put on a headdress with lots of coins on it. And the coins represent the wealth, the, the bride price. So currency. So jewelry of that type say, served a dual purpose. It could be used as currency. It also could be used as wealth. And so part three or point three to the uses of jewelry and dormant is, as was mentioned before, to signify the value or the worth of a person. So again, we go back to Genesis 24 verses 10 and 22. And there we see that Abraham is a rich man. How do we know he's a rich man? Because of the weight of gold that was there in the jewelry. Now, it was also could be used as the spoils of war. It was legitimate if you conquered an enemy. Let's look at Exodus chapter 11 and verse 12. Sorry, verse 2. Exodus 11 and verse 2. If somebody is there, I'm not sure where our roving mic is. Microphone, somebody put your put your hand up if you're ready to read, please. So, microphone to the front here. And for the next person, we're going to look at Exodus 12, 36 as well. Exodus 11, verse 2. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbor, and every woman of her neighbor, jewels of silver and jewels of gold. So what's happening here? What's the story at this point? This is the children of Israel about to depart... From Egypt. Now at this time the plagues are falling. God has waged a war against the Egyptian gods and he has won the war. And as the children of Israel are leaving Egypt, they take the spoils of war with them. Let's have a look at Exodus chapter 12 and verse 36. Exodus 12, verse 36. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such, such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. 
Now notice the end of that verse. What did the Israelites do to the Egyptians? They spoiled them. This was the spoils of war. God had waged war against the false gods of Egypt. Of course he won. And now the children of Israel got the spoils of war. We can also see this in Second Chronicles chapter 20 as well. Verses um, 24 onwards. You'll find also there the Israelites got the spoils of war. They got the plunder for war. So that's another use. Now, the fourth usage, that was the third usage as an evidence of wealth. The fourth usage of jewelry in the Old Testament times in the Bible was a symbol of social status. So there's, uh, for example, Israel's king, second uh, Samuel chapter 1 and verse 10. And while somebody's going 2 Samuel 1.10, somebody else can go for Zechariah 9.16. Okay, who's got 2 Samuel 1.10? Zechariah 9.16 will be the next one. So I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live after that he had fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them hither unto my Lord. Now where do we see jewelry and adornment being used in that verse? He had a crown on his head exactly. and he had a bracelet on his arm. Exactly. Now, what did the crown mean? He was a king. He, he was, was a king. king. Yeah. So there you go. It's a symbol of social status. How do you know he's the king? He's got the crown on his head. Um, is, did somebody find Zechariah 9.16 as well? And the Lord their God shall save them in that day. <clears throat> as the flock of his people... For they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his land. <clears throat> okay, so you notice they're the stones of a crown. So once again, the use in social status. Last uh, piece of the Bible I'm going to go to is Psalms 45 uh, and verse 14, where it says here, this is talking about the king's daughter. In fact, from verse 13. It says, the king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought to her. Now, here, it's just talking about the fineness of the clothes. But again, the clothes are adorned. There's a, a costly array that's being used for the queen. God also uses this symbolism in Ezekiel 16 when he talks about adorning his people, adorning his bride. And so you find this, this idea that God adorns his bride, dresses her up to look like the bride of a king. Now, we've got two more areas where it was used. One we've, we've really touched on already, uh, but number five was as a symbol of power and authority. Well, we've looked at that already where we've seen with the crown, that the crown was a symbol of power and authority. Um, when that crown was removed, of course, Second Samuel tells us that when that crown was removed, that's also a symbol of humiliation of that person. And then lastly, we've got in Exodus 28. Exodus 28 gives us the last purpose of jewelry and adornment, which is the religious purpose. Now, again, we're not going to read through the whole of that chapter, but the clothes of the high priest had a great religious significance and symbolism whilst being related directly to his work. And no other priest had the adornments that the high priest had. So if you look through Exodus 28, you'll see a description there of the various adornments on the clothes of the high priest, but out of the priesthood, he was the only one that had that. Now, 
Can anybody hazard a guess or tell me why would it only be the high priest whose clothes were adorned? What did the high priest represent? I hear a voice from the wilderness crying out. The high priest represented Christ. That's why he was the only one that would have some adornment. Now, you'll notice throughout the Old Testament, the wearing of jewelry is not forbidden except in a certain circumstance, which we're going to look at a little bit later. But it was encouraged specifically for the high priest. Now, I want to make four points really about that. Um, I'm not going to go through um, Bible references because you can find them if you look through, for example, Exodus 28. Look at the description of the clothes that the high priest was wearing. The jewelry that was there, now remember there were two stones on the, the shoulders of the high priest. This was the, the Urim and the, th and the Thummim. There were the ten stones on the breastplate of precious stones that represented the, did I say ten? It was twelve stones. Twelve stones representing the twelve tribes of Israel. The jewelry that was on the high priest, it was beautiful in its simplicity. And there's an interesting point. None of the stones, for example, had any engraving upon it whatsoever. It was just very simple something that had been made by God, cut to the right shape, but not graven. Now, secondly, the jewelry itself was part of the vestments of the high priest. Now, what does that mean, to say it's part of the vestments? Part of the clothing. Or in other words, let's just make this then really specific, the high priest did not put any jewelry on himself. It was on his clothes. And he only wore the clothes when he was officiating as the high priest. Or in other words, when he was representing Jesus, he wore the jewelry. When he was not representing Christ, he did not. In fact, sanctity of life forbade mutilation of the body. Now this is really an interesting point that we won't have time to really go into depth on this, but basically, piercing the ears, piercing the nose, all of these kind of things were forbidden. Because the body was a sanctified body. In New Testament times, we're told that the body is actually what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, there is one exception to that rule. Does anybody know what that exception was? Yes, go ahead, Brother Louis. Have we got, where's the um, roving mic, please? So we can hear about the one exception to piercing the body. A slave in the law of Moses, if they wanted to prolong their stay with their master, was taken to a doorpost or something like that. Mm -hmm. His ear was bored with an awl. And an airing was placed in there. Yes. Now that's interesting. That's, although it was forbidden to do all of this, there's that one circumstance. Um, Sister Hyacinth, can you remember the actual chapter and verse? 15 and verse 34. Fifteen. Let me have a quick look. Oh, okay. Deuteronomy chapter 15. So it's Deuteronomy 15, verse 17. Let's have a quick look. Of course. Deuteronomy 15, 17. In fact, we start from the, uh, uh, the, the verse before, in fact. It shall be, and he's talking about the servant, the, the slave who has finished his time of servitude. If he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee because he loves you and your house and because he's he feels good with you, then exactly as our brother said, you will take an awl. This is a pointed, like a pointed screwdriver, I suppose you could say. An ice pick. And, uh, thank you, an ice pick. 
and you would thrust it through his ear as he was stand, standing by the doorpost. Now, Sister Hyacinth, why would he be standing by the doorpost? <laughs> you know, when I was much younger, I used to think that he would be attached to the door. I believed that this, this imagery for me is that the slave would be attached, his ear would be attached to the door, and I could not work it out because how would he perform his duties if he was attached to the post permanently? But I've since learned that the post was used as a brace so that when the oar hits his ear, it doesn't flippity-floppity about like one's ear would. Um, obviously, the door post would be the, the something that you would put behind the ear to keep it steady so that the um, hole would be delivered adequately. Um, and then a, an earring would be placed in the ear as a sign of ownership. Now, funny enough, I'm actually, I don't know if anybody can help me with this. I'm actually looking for the scripture that says an earring would be placed in it. We've looked at the scripture which says that a hole was bored, but it doesn't actually say there, unless I'm missing something, that an earring is placed in it. But, look, this is a minor point, and I'm not going to stay too long on this. For the manservant and the maidservant, this could happen. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to draw this out is because modern days, you know, when I was younger, if you were to get close enough to me, you would find I've got two holes pierced in my ear here. Now, it doesn't mean that I was a slave twice and spent two seven-year periods. And by the way, that was what happened. Slavery in Old Testament times, every seven years, the slaves were released. You, this wasn't a permanent thing. And so after the seven years, that's when the, the servant could say, or the slave could say, I don't want to go, I want to stay with you. Then a hole was made. Now, of course, when I was younger, we used to put holes in our ears to wear decoration. And one often wonders, did, was there any thinking, any feeling then of what the meaning was? Where do we get this idea from? And perhaps if it was made obvious that this was a sign of somebody being a slave, would many people rush to put holes in their ear like that? Now, in fact, if you go back even further than that, you had the people who worked in the temple of the sun god. And they also had an earring pierced into their ear. It meant that they were listening on behalf of the sun god. There was a, a, a spy network you had. If you were standing discussing something, maybe you were plotting something, and you saw somebody with an earring, you shut your mouth quick because that one's listening to go and report back. And so a lot of this adornment was found, it was prevalent in pagan worship. Sister Isaac. Exodus 21, verse 6 says, And his master shall bear it in the Not the earring, though. Yeah. Okay, that was, that's a little bit of homework, folks. It would be good to actually find that because I've heard this said many times. But actually, all I can see there in the Bible is that a hole was bored. But anyway, that's, that's the point we were trying to make, was that the, the body is considered to be a, a sanctified object, that you're not supposed to go around abusing it. Same goes for tattoos as well. You know, again, today there is a, a real resurgence or an uptake of people having tattoos. And it seems that nobody thinks about the fact that God says, this is your body, fearfully and wonderfully made. You shouldn't be putting things on it. Personally, when I was younger, I liked the idea of getting a tattoo, but I was put off. And I was put off very simply in this way. I worked with a man who had a tattoo of a dragon on his arm. Beautiful thing. All over his arm. When I first saw it, I was in awe. I said, wow beautiful green dragon it must have taken a lot of time it must have cost a lot of money i'm talking about the 1970s it must have cost a lot of money to have had that done i said to him i said 
That is so beautiful. And do you know what he said to me? He said, I hate it. I wish I'd never had it done. And I'm saving up the money to get it removed. And I said to him, how much is it going to cost you to get it removed? And he said, if I remember correctly, he said it was 50 pounds an inch. Now, if you imagine, he's got the whole of his forearm. I mean, how many square inches that is, I, I'm not even going to try and calculate that. It must have been a couple of hundred, well, hundred, let's say. Well, that means it's going to cost him 5,000 pounds to get that removed. So here's a word of warning to anybody. Remember that a tattoo is permanent. Now, I think we've got some messages online. Who is doing our online responses? What have we got coming in online? All right, so we have a comment from Kaku. From first Peach, um, they're quoted from First Peter chapter 3, verse 3 to 4. In the Kim J's version, which says, Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plaiting their hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on the apparel. And verse 4 says, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Okay, thank you for that. That's somebody who's leapt from the beginning of the presentation right to the end. But I thank you for that. It shows we're paying attention. Uh, any others? Was that the only comment that's come in? Um, we had one earlier from Sister Corol, where she said that the high priest's robe was adorned with jewelry in the sanctuary. Okay, amen, amen. And Sister Corol, welcome. Always good to virtually see you with us, even if we don't see you in person. And the same to everybody else online. You know, we, one of the reasons why we love people writing these comments in is because some of you we get to know just by the name that we see online. But you're as much a part of our congregation as the people who are here with us live in church. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Um, Old Testament attitudes towards jewellery. Can you name anything from the Old Testament that is said to be of greater value than jewellery? Now I can hear someone muttering in the congregation Proverbs, and they're quite right. There's a couple of places. In fact, there's three places in Proverbs. So I'm going to give you the references, folks that are here, and I want you to look them up. Have three of you look them up. Somebody go for Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Somebody else goes for Proverbs 31, 10. And the last person goes to Proverbs 20, 15. In fact, perhaps if you'd raise a hand for me, just so I can see that you're looking it up. Who's going for Proverbs 3, 13? Nobody? Thank you. There's somebody going for Proverbs 3.13. Proverbs 31.10. Who's going for that? Nobody again. Okay, well I'm going to ask somebody to please look for that. And Proverbs 20.15. Who's looking for that? Thank you. I've got somebody. There. You know, folks, for you, those of you at home, if you could see what I'm seeing, I'm seeing lots of people with their heads down in their Bibles. And when I say who's looking for this verse, nobody puts their hand up. They're trying to find something else to, to, to impress me with. Proverbs 3.10? Sorry, it was, uh, yeah, Proverbs 3.13 to 15. Oh, 13 to 15. Okay. Ready? Yep, go ahead, please. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things that canst desire, that thou canst desire, are not to be compared unto her. Thank you. So, what's more valuable than silver and gold? Reader, tell us. Wisdom. Wisdom. Okay, so the Bible says... And understanding. Wisdom and understanding. So, learning is more valuable than silver and gold. Okay, Proverbs 31.10. Did anybody actually look that up? Oh, you're a terrible congregation. 
You're just ignoring what I'm saying and doing your own thing here. So, okay, Proverbs 31.10, I'm going to go for that. And that is, it says, Proverbs 31.10 says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. So, wisdom was the first thing we found. The next thing, a virtuous woman. And now, hopefully somebody has found... Proverbs 2015. I've got somebody at the front here, but the microphone's going to the back. Okay. There is a gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a pre precious jewelry. Okay, so what is a precious jewelry? The lips of knowledge. So notice the Bible says very clearly wisdom. Lips of knowledge, and what was the last thing? Virtuous. A virtuous woman. In fact, some translations, or even perhaps King James, will tell you a good wife. So my wife, listen to that. You are more valuable than silver and gold. Now, what did it mean? I'm so, sometimes I'm glad that my wife hasn't got a microphone with her all the time. <laughs> What did it mean when jewellery was taken off? When the children of Israel took off their jewellery, what was the meaning of doing that? Okay. Contrite heart. That's number one. Thank you. Anything else we can say? Now, if we look at the story of Jacob, when Jacob repented and went to Bethel, he was blessed by God, his name was changed to Israel, and what did he do there? Let's have a look. Genesis chapter, I think it's 35, 4. Who's found it? Okay. Roving Mike, where are you? To the front here, please. Do you know, I, I think my roving mic goes wherever he wants to go. It doesn't matter who puts their hand up. He's off. Right. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange, all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings, which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under, his, under the oak, which was by Shechem. Now, do you notice two things going in parallel here? What were they giving up? There was two things they gave up. Same time. Strange gods and their earrings, their jewelry. Jewelry wearing was often associated with going after other gods. It was a form of idolatry. <laughs> Excuse me. And so when people took off their jewelry, they were rejecting idolatry as they were coming before the Lord. Now, notice something. Have you ever been to a foreign country which is not a Christian country? If you go to another country, let's say, for example, India or you go to one of the Buddhist countries, what do you find about their statues of their gods? Is there anything that you would notice? Jewelry. In, in fact, I was fascinated. I went into a Buddhist temple in Thailand, and I watched people buying leaves of fine gold. Do you know what a gold leaf is? They would buy the gold leaf, and then they would take it, they would put it onto the statue, and they would rub it onto the statue. And more and more people would come and put more and more gold leaf on the statue. And the statue became a burnished gold statue. And when you go to a Hindu temple, you find again all this jewelry that are used there. Why can't we do that with God? Why can't we put fine leaf on the statue of God and deck him with jewelry? Okay, a hand's gone up to tell me why. I'm going 
And so our roving mic, you've really got to keep your eye on what's going on. I go. believe the commandment says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Mm. See, it was a bit of a trick question. Why don't you find us putting gold and jewelry on statues of God? Because God says, don't make any statues. Because he knows if you do make statues, you're going to start putting gold and silver and you're going to start adorning it. So, where is, when is the one time when precious stones are associated with God? Turn to Exodus 24 and verse 10. And when you get there, please raise your hand. Exodus 24, verse 10. Here is the story. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, 70 elders, they're, they're all going up to the mountain. They're going up to go to where God is. And then in verse 10 of Exodus 24, what does it say there? And they saw the God of Israel, and there under his feet, as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. Now notice that where you find the precious metals, precious stones and everything associated with God is where he lives. Because these stones were created by God to beautify the world not the people that were in them. So where God dwells, there we find these, the beauty of the precious stones, part of his handiwork. It's not possible that they can contribute to his beauty or glory because God is, is above all of these things. But it can be somewhere where God is can be decorated like that. So these metals and stones created to beautify the world, not the people. Now, when I first said about not wearing jewelry, when did they take it off? The first response I got was what? It was a sign of repentance. Now, where do we find this sign of repentance in the Bible? Let's look at Exodus chapter 33. Now, what's happening in Exodus 33? We've just had a situation. Moses goes up the mountain. He's there with God. He's receiving the Ten Commandments. He comes down from the mountain. And what does he find going on when he comes down? Okay, where's the roving mic, please? He found the people dancing and worshipping the golden calf. The golden calf. So this was the god Apis that they would brought the memory of out of Egypt. Can you tell me, where did they get the gold from to make the golden calf? From Egypt. They brought it with them from Egypt. This was part of the spoils, the plunder that they'd taken with them. What was the purpose? Why were they bringing that out? To build the sanctuary. To build the sanctuary. But instead of building the sanctuary, it's rather interesting to note they had enough gold with them to build a golden calf, which would later be crushed up and they were forced to drink it, and still there was enough gold left for them to make the sanctuary. God made provision for everything that was going on. Now, when we get to Exodus 33, which is the next chapter after this incident, the children of Israel are going to leave Sinai. And we start in verse 1. The Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which you brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land that I swore unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed 
will I give it? And he says, now you're, and my angel's going to go before you. You're going to be led to this place. You're going to go into the land. It's described rather euphemistically as the land flowing in milk and honey. And then, when the people went in there, before they left, God pointed out that the people had been rebellious. And so to show their sign of contrition, what did they do? And that's where we come to verse 4 of Exodus 33. Okay, Exodus 33 verse 4 says this, And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on his ornaments. Why not? Because it was a sign of repentance. When people repented, they took off their ornaments. They took off their fancy apparel. They put on plain clothes. You've heard the phrase of sackcloth and ashes. All of this is a sign of saying, I'm sorry, I repent. And so the children of Israel, before they left Mount Sinai, they repented and they took off all of their jewelry. Now, the interesting question is, when did they put it back on again? Because you will notice that from that time, they took off their apparel. And if you go to Judges chapter 8, Judges chapter 8, verses 24 to 26, and Gideon saying unto them, now this is when it's now time for, for Gideon to step forward. He says, Gideon says, I would desire a request of you that you would give me every man the earrings of his Pray. Now the children of Israel had slain some people, they were Ishmaelites. And because they were Ishmaelites, they wore gold earrings. And Gideon said, now give me the prey. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and they did cast onto the garment all the earrings they'd taken off their prey. Why was it so simple? Because the children of Israel were not wearing those earrings. They'd taken them as plunder and kept them to themselves. And then when Gideon said, give me the earrings, they just went, boom, there you go. There's the plunder. It became the normal way for the children of Israel to dress after they left from Mount Sinai. In fact, in the ancient world, the Israelites were distinguished from anybody else by their worship, their morals, and their dress code. Three aspects. Now, let's bring this right home to today, to us here in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What distinguishes us from others in the world? Number one, worship. We worship on the seventh day. Number two, morals. We hold a very high moral standard. And number three, and now here's Sister Hyacinth's point, the dress code. We don't wear jewelry. Now, here is the million dollar question. Why do we not wear jewelry? Now, this is a question before anybody answers. It's a question I ask many times. Because we've set a standard, and we've said, we as a people, we don't wear jewelry. So I'm going to ask you why we don't wear jewelry. There is a very specific reason. Can because, anybody tell me? Because we're living in the antitypical day of atonement, where we have come before the Lord um, without our adornment, in contrition and hum humility, and we are asking that our sins be forgiven and asking Jesus to, at well, he has already atoned for our sins, but in respect. So I can sum it all up 
very simply. The word uh, at, at the end will be repentance. We are repentant people, but notice what Sister Hyacinth said at the very start of her explanation. We as a people recognize that we are in the antitypical day of atonement. Now when you go back and look at the Old Testament, one thing that was noticeable on the day of atonement, it was the time when the people went before God in sorrow, in repentance, asking for forgiveness of sin. How did they demonstrate it? By taking off their jewelry by taking off the fine apparel, and they said, now we come as we are. No claim to any extra beauty other than what God has given us. And this is the reason why as Seventh-day Adventists we don't wear jewelry, because we're in the antitypical Day of Atonement. Now there's lots, lots of other reasons that come out. People will use, but this is the fi fi uh, this is the, the the main one. Now, Brother Cross, did you want to did you want to ask or? Yeah, ah, that's a very good question. Why do we wear wedding bun? Yes. Why exactly? Now, the that's first thing cool. I'm going to do is I'm going to hold up my hands and say yes. Why do you wear wedding bands? Yeah. Now, there is a reason. The reason that is often given. And I think this is very pertinent quite often for women. Women will often say, I want to have something on which signifies to other men that I am married, that I am taken. Maybe I want to have something on my husband that signifies to other women that he is taken. And I know of one particular circumstance where a woman away from her husband, a man, as they say, set his hat towards her, thinking he could court her because he didn't see a wedding ring on her finger. But when we are a Christian people, we shouldn't need a wedding band to show that we are wedded to another person. It should be demonstrated by the way that we live our lives. But you're quite right. I mean, it's a very pertinent question because we do make allowance for the fact that some people say, no, I want to signify the fact that I am a married person. One of the things I love about this church is that we are a non-dogmatic church in that we allow a little bit of flexibility in some of these areas. Now, uh, Sister Joel, did you want to say something? I saw your hand coming up. The Bible says we must not adorn ourselves with jewelry. Mm -hmm. That's meaning, for example, wearing earrings, wearing other jewelry, like many jewelry rather than like a wedding band or so. Sorry, say that last part again. I, I just missed that. No, what I said, the last part was the, yes, we can wear a wedding band to signify that you are married to someone. Mm -hmm. But the Bible is saying we are not to adorn ourselves with jewelry. That's meaning like, Wearing a bangle, an earring, a necklace, like what people normally, some people normally do. So if I could paraphrase what you're saying, it would sound to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're saying to wear a simple band around one finger to signify you're married, that's not a problem. But if it was highly decorated and ornamented and made to be something extravagant, then that's where the problem starts to come in. Would that be a good summation? That's part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Our time is running out. I want, to, um, I, I want to make one observation. If anybody else has got any comments, please raise your hands. I don't know if there's anything else online. And what I would like us to do as well, we had that very good comment that came in online. Can we please go back to that scripture? I want to use that as my closing scripture in Peter. So the person who read out the comment, please... Mm -hmm. Be prepared to read that scripture for us again. I see one hand at the back. Yes. What do we consider jewelry? Is it just gold and silver? No, it is anything that adorns you. Because remember, it's not specifically just adornment. Sorry, jewelry. It is adornment. 
So anything that you use to adorn yourself, anything that's superfluous. Now, this leads me beautifully into a story. I want to tell you. Yeah. I'm going to try and make it a quick story. My stories are never that quick, but I'm going to try and make it a quick story. My wife and I, we are in a foreign land. We're in an, uh, an, a Muslim land. And we're there on a holiday, and I think it's the only time in our lives when we've ever been on what you would call a package holiday, where they do various things for you. And we found that we'd signed up to go on some excursions, and when it came to the Sabbath day, we thought we were going to be on some nice outdoor excursions, but actually, one of the excursions was going to a jewellery factory and a jewellery shop. And we hummed and hard as to what we should do about this because the only purpose of going there was that they wanted to sell us jewellery. And so we prayed. And before we went, the prayer was simply this. We said, Lord, we've got ourselves in this situation, but can we have some use to this? Can you send to us people to whom we can witness at this time? Now, also, I discovered in Turkey where we were that they made a very nice apple tea. And so I also tacked on to the prayer, and Lord, it would be nice to have some apple tea, because obviously it's a Sabbath, I can't go and buy a cup of tea, but it would be nice to have some apple tea. So we went to the factory, the factory tour took five minutes, and then they usher you into a showroom where they're trying to sell you uh, gold and silver and jewellery, and you spend the next hour or two there. But we, would, would, we were not interested. And when the salesman came over, we said... No, we're not interested. And he said, oh, but we've got this, we've got that, we've got the other. And I said, look at us. Look at me and look at my wife. There's no jewelry on us. There's nothing. No rings, no bracelets, no, no necklace, no nothing. And the man looked and he said, why? And I said, well, there's a couple of reasons. I said, first of all, whilst there is somebody in this, in this world that does not have anything to eat, why would I go and spend money on adorning myself when that person is starving? I said, number two, God made us beautiful as we are. We don't need anything else to enhance the beauty that God's given us. The man looked at us and he said, what religion are you? And I said to him, to put it in perspective for you, we are Ahl al-Kitab, we are people of the book. He said, I've heard of this in the Quran, what do you believe? And we started to talk about our beliefs. He forgot trying to sell anything to us, and we started to talk about God. And we started to talk, in fact, we started to talk about how the Quran says that you should keep the seventh day Sabbath. And we started to explore. And as we started to explore these things, so other salespeople left from where they were and came until we had all the salespeople assembled around us and we preached the gospel in that jewelry shop. And as we were standing there preaching, a young lady walked past with a tray in her hand and the man I was talking to snapped his finger and said, come. And she came over with her tray with some glasses of hot liquid on it. And he looked at us and he said, please, try some of our famous apple tea. And I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I asked for people that we could witness to, and you brought us these people. I asked for a cup of apple tea, and the Lord said, I can do that for you as well, John. Sister Bishop, you wanted to add something to that? Do you want to use the microphone? Sorry. The Muslims take their jewellery off when they go to Mecca. Mm -hmm. they, they take all of it off and they go without it. So there is something quite significant about coming to God without your adornment when you want to... to um, be humble before God and you want to, what's the word I'm looking for, recommit, because that's what they do. They believe they, they go to Mecca to recommit and to, what's the word I'm looking they're for? They're doing their pilgrimage. Yeah, and they're that's doing not the their, word, but um, yes. And, it, and it, they remove all their jewellery. Well, go a little bit further than that. They also take off all their fine clothes. All the women put on their black, all the men put on their white. 
And so everyone who's going there on that pilgrimage, on that Hajj, going around Mecca, they're all dressed exactly the same to signify they are all the same. Yes, my sister. My family up north is all Muslim, sir. Uh, when they're going to Mecca also, they have to pay mostly, all, well, all their bills, um, including their credit cards, um, and the older generation, what they tend to do is try and pay off the... So they give a minimum of five years before they go to Mecca so they know that the bills that they got or their mortgage, if it's close to an end, they know and they gather and pay that off. So when they go to Mecca, they go without financial uh, burden. burden. Yeah. So when they give themselves to, 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 to the Lord, they know that they have no burdens other than themselves, where they cleanse all their sins. Mm, uh, mm. That's what my uncle told I, me. I love what you said. I just, I wish they were giving themselves to the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Perhaps one day in one of these series, we can, we can talk. We've done some talks about outreach and evangelism. Perhaps one day we could actually look at reaching out to Muslims because there, there are a lot of similarities. They are our cousins, and we really ought to take a little bit of time to actually tell them what their Quran says. And they will learn that Jesus is indeed God. They will learn that they are told to keep the seventh day Sabbath. And they will learn that far from being corrupt, the Bible is the foundation of their beliefs. We've come to an end. If there are any other comments or questions, you have to make them right now. Otherwise, hopefully we have that scripture from... Oh, we've got something online? Is there something online? Um, we have a couple. Um, Sister Crow says from Proverbs chapter 25, verse 12. And she says as well that they buried the earrings under a tree. And she's also said that some SDAs wear wedding rings and other stone. Why the difference? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I think we, we've covered the, the wedding rings part. And then uh, we have a comment from Chelsea Grant, which says, God is amazing. What a testimony. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. and that's all. So now, if I can then get you to rewind, what was that quotation from Peter that you gave earlier on? Let's have that as a quotation to finish on. Um, so... First Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, which reads, Whose adorning let it not be that the outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of the apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is it is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Amen. And you'll notice in that quotation from Peter, he doesn't just talk about jewelry. He doesn't talk about fine clothes. He also talks about the plaiting of hair. I'm not going to get into that one. Thankfully, we're finished. I know it's a dangerous road to go down. But all forms of adornment are condemned on that basis. Better you adorn yourself with the character of Christ than adorn yourself with bits of creation. Let's have a word of prayer as we close to finish off. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that we've had the opportunity to go through your word, to see the truth about the time that we're living in today. We recognize that we are living in the antitypical day of atonement. This is not a time for us to be adorning ourselves. It's not a time for us to be doing anything other than searching our souls, confessing our sins, and preparing to meet our maker. I believe that Jesus is coming very soon. And whether he comes within my lifetime or not, I pray that I personally will be ready to see Jesus. And I pray for every one of us here in church and those online that we may be ready when that day comes, no matter who may precede whom, that we will all be ready for Jesus to come, reflecting the character of Christ to those around. 
Bless us, be with us through the week ahead. And thank you, Lord, as always, for the blessings you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Have a happy week ahead. And we will see you all same place next week. Amen. <laughs>